Good morning. We're in the middle of a series where we're talking about the impact of what Jesus came to do. And he came just in time for Christmas. Um, and as we've been looking at the impact of Jesus coming to earth, we have identified over the past weeks that a number of things have occurred. And the reason why we want to understand these things is that the more clearly we understand what Jesus accomplishes, then we are in a position to appreciate why his coming to earth is so significant for us. We noticed a couple of things. Slavery ended and sonship has begun. And when we try to understand the impact of what Jesus has done, the ending of slavery leading to somebody receiving the full rights of a citizen is really what salvation is all about. This past week, I watched again, great movie, Amazing Grace, which is the story of William Wilberforce. And in 17, I think, 87 or so, he introduced a bill into Parliament for the first time to outlaw the slave trade. And I think it was fully and finally the slave trade was uh, defeated, was put out of existence by an act of Parliament in the early 1830s. And it was, I'm sure, with that foundation that Abraham Lincoln then took a hold of this and then enacted it as an act of Congress in the United States. But it began in England with William Wilberforce. And that whole image of what happens when somebody goes from being a slave to a son is indicative of what Jesus accomplishes. Slavery is ended. Sonship has begun. Salvation is accomplished. That's what salvation means. If you have your sheet, look with me at the passage, Galatians 4. We'll read the last part of this passage that has been the passage that we've gone back to over the last three weeks. Let me read. It says, When the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. Again, what we can see here spiritually, moving from the status of a slave to the status of a child is what being saved is all about. The historic incident that brings this about is the coming to earth of Jesus Christ. The gospel he proclaimed is the spiritual equivalent of the Emancipation Proclamation that Lincoln brought into being. It talks about Roman families and how a child is raised by a supervised by a tutor and then at age 14 and age 25 comes out from under the supervision of a tutor. Let me explain that one more time. In a Roman family, a child was placed under the supervision of a tutor until the child was age 14. And then furthermore, under the supervision of a curator between the age of 14 and the age of 25, during this period, the direct supervision of the tutor was primary. Now, it's not that the child was not the child of the father. The father was still the father. The child was still the child of the family. However, the father intentionally entrusted the care of the child into the supervision of the tutor. After the period of supervision was completed, the child received the full rights of a son, and the father's role takes over the tutor's role. This is how Paul explains what happens to us with Jesus Christ. It also explains why the first half of the Bible seems different from the last half. We've discussed how if you read through the first half of the Bible, there are some images. There are some things that happen that you look and you would think, this is very harsh. And what Paul says is prior to Jesus coming, how God treated mankind is the way a Roman father treated his child when he places him under the care of the tutor. So, 
What am I saying? The law is like the tutor. And the first half of the Bible reflects the supervision of the tutor, the supervision of the law. Again, it's that God entrusts the care of humankind into the hands of a tutor for a period of time, knowing that there will be a time at which the time of the tutor will be over and the time of the father giving direct supervision will begin. And that's how we're to understand Jesus coming to earth. The time of the tutor is now over. The time of the Father giving direct supervision through the Son begins. With Jesus coming, God's treatment of mankind is like how a Roman father assumes direct control and terminates the role of the tutor. The second half of the Bible reflects the supervision of the Father. That's why it seems so different. Directly supervising. The time of the tutor was terminated by the coming of the Son. Leads to a question by way of review. Why would he do that? I mean, if you're going to create the world... Why subject someone to the supervision of a tutor, to the supervision of the law? We looked at a couple things in terms of the impact of law. The law reveals sin. It says, therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. Now, we're going to raise some things here, and you're going to go, Mike, I don't get this. You know, so you're saying, Mike, that, okay, God creates the world. And he puts the world under the supervision of law for a period of time, knowing that this time was only going to be for it, not forever and ever. And, and what Paul would indicate and what we're talking about is that what the law does, it reveals sin. I, I remember, and I told you this before, when in elementary school, they, they used to give you once a year this gum that you would chew. You chew this gum, and then you went... And it showed all the cavities. And that's, in a sense, what the law is like. You know, this gum didn't create the cavities. It just showed the cavities that were already there. And that's how we're to understand the law. God gives us the law, and what the law does, it reveals the sin, the transgression that already exists. It's not just that, though. The law produces sin. The law was added so that the trespass might increase. Read that last word. Again, if you're, if you're following me, you're saying, whoa, Ty, whoa. Are you saying that the law was given so that trespasses might... Is that what it's... Do you read what I read there? The trespasses would increase so that there would be more sin? That seems to be what it says. Um, oh, that's interesting. Um, it arouses sinful desires. When we were controlled by the sinful nature, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our bodies so that we bore fruit for death. What it seems to say then is if you put somebody under the influence of law, sinful desires don't diminish. They increase, decrease. What's the answer? Increase. That's interesting, isn't it? So if you want to get somebody to sin more, what you tell them, do these ten things or else. It keeps sin alive. Apart from the law, sin is dead. One way to bring sin to life is put law over it. So it reveals sin, produces sin, arouses sinful desires, and keeps sin alive. Why would God put mankind, humankind, under this kind of influence? And here's the answer to lead us to rely on Jesus as our only hope to be accepted by God. That's why God puts humankind from creation through the time till Christ comes is to cause humankind to understand you cannot keep a code. I don't care whether it's ten things, twelve things, eight things. You need to rely on Jesus Christ as your only hope to be accepted by God. Look what it says. The Scripture declares that the whole world is a prisoner of sin so that what was promised being given through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to all who believe. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. And you get the point then. The law is like a prison guard in a way. It's a tutor, but not a nice tutor. It brings about and makes the problem worse so that we come to a place of understanding. If I'm going to have to do what you say and don't do what you forbid in order to be accepted, I am in a lot of trouble. Not just me, you too. We are. Humankind is. The law reveals the problem. It's like a thermometer. 
that indicates how sick we are. Again, you put a thermometer in your ear, you swipe it across your forehead, you stick it under your tongue. What does that do? It has no power to cure you. It can't help you. What it can do is indicate how sick you are. This is how we're to understand the impact of law. It lets us know how sick we are. But you can't take law and be cured. That seems to be what it says. The law shows us that we are slaves to sin. The law shows us this so that we might become sons and daughters of God. And by way of review, this is a verse we saw last week. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now, a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So, if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. It d divides humankind into two categories. Everyone on the planet fits under one of two columns. You are either a slave to sin or a son of God. That's it. It's not a bunch of in-between, not two classes of slaves to sins. It's just everyone is either a slave to sin or a son of God. And the way you go from one to the other is if you're a slave to sin, what that means is that you have some choices about how you sin. You don't have choices about whether or not you sin. Does that make sense? See, a slave can't do what a slave wants to do. They have to do the will of the one in charge. And that's how we are to understand, according to Jesus, what it's like. We are slaves to sin. We might have some input relative to how we do it, but not whether we do it. We're slaves to sin. And there's only one way you can go from being a slave to sin to being a child of God. That is, if somebody in this family reaches over and brings you into the family. That's how it works with Jesus. He is the Son of God. Those who believe in Him, Jesus takes by the hand and leads them into the place where they're part of God's forever family. Question, if you then become a child of God, does that mean you no longer sin? Anybody here free from sin? Of course not. What it means, sin doesn't have the power to make it so that you're not part of the family. See, if you're a part of the family, you're a part of the family. Just because you mess up, you're not booted out of the family. Now, we've had time with family over the past holidays. And you probably, if we had a discussion... You probably would agree with me. Families aren't perfect. <laughs> I'm sure you could think of one or two things that your brother or sister, mother or father did wrong that, that you would classify. Tell you what, that was a sin. <laughs> and they could do the same with you. <laughs> but just because you mess up, are you any less a son or daughter of the family? What would you have to do to be not a member of the family? In a way, their blood is pouring through your veins. Even if they would disown you, you're still a child. Their blood's, and that's the way it is. When Jesus takes you and brings you into being part of the family, it's not that you're perfect. It's just that imperfections will not cause you not to be a part of this family. You are members of God's forever family. Um, that's, what we're to, that's how we're to understand what Jesus does. Sin, then, is an enslaving power. And, in fact, what I want to do, flip your paper over. I wanted to throw this in a place where you had an... Uh, I'm going to just run through this again. This is kind of by way of review. It gives a, a, hopefully, a clearer image of what it means to be saved. People need to be saved when, through their own fault or through some superior power, they come under the control of someone else. That's what sin is about. It's being bonded to an enslaving power. It's not just doing things. It's not just choices that you make. It's that you don't have choices. You can choose how you sin, but not if you sin. You're under the control of someone else. Therefore, you need to be saved. That's 
what it means to be saved. It's being under the influence of an enslaving power. And what it means is being thus controlled, they have lost their freedom to implement their will and decisions. A slave really doesn't have free will. You can ask your slave, what do you want to do? It doesn't matter. I have to do what my master tells me to do. And that's how we're to understand being enslaved to sin. Their own resources are inadequate to deal with that other power. To be a slave means you can't free yourself. And therefore, they can only gain their freedom by the intervention of a third party. The individual who reaches into slavery brings this individual out of slavery into the family. That individual is called the Savior. That individual is called the Savior. The individual who moves from slavery to sin to being a son of God has been saved. Saved. That's what it means to be saved. People are saved when they believe that as the Son of God, Jesus is the Word through whom God the Father fully and finally reveals Himself to the world. Jesus is the Word through whom God fully and finally reveals Himself to the world. What is God like? Jesus Christ. How much does God love people? Jesus demonstrated it by dying on the cross. How does God feel? He feels like Jesus Christ felt. What does God value? He values what Jesus Christ valued. But you said, Mike, but there was the first part of the Bible and the second. Jesus fully and finally reveals the truth of who God the Father is. And people are saved when they come to the place of understanding that it's Jesus who reveals the Father. There are some good spiritual figures in history, devout people. Siddhartha Gautama, Muhammad, they weren't Jesus. And you say, oh, Mo, they didn't claim to be God. They didn't fully and finally reveal God as the Son of God. Jesus did, and that's what it means to be saved. That's, you need to be saved when you believe that, and people are saved when they remain in Jesus, as Jesus' words remain in them and are transformed into sons and daughters of God who express their faith through love. That's what people are saved when they remain in Jesus as Jesus' words remain in them. You make room for Jesus' words. And you know what starts to happen? It changes how you think about God, about the Father. You come to understand Him. And coming to understand the Father, what He's like, moves us to experience salvation. So, salvation is a decision. It begins with a choice to follow Jesus. If I were to sit down with us and say, how have you come to be in the place that you are spiritually? We could have, I bet you we would represent a number of different kinds of approaches. Some of us moved gradually. It's a process where we learned a little bit more and we learned a little bit more and we learned a little bit more. If I were to ask, is there a critical time when you decided to be a follower of Christ? You can remember the prayer. You can remember the day. Some of you say, you know, Mike, I can't. Some of us can remember a time. For me, I was busy trying to make myself good enough for God to accept me. And I thought I was doing it. <laughs> I was more religious than anybody I knew. I went to church more often. I did more things. I, if, if God graded on a curve, I don't know, maybe some of you were really good. I think I had you beat. Maybe. Yeah, I don't know. I, Doug, what did Martin say about that? <laughs> now, <laughs> uh, at any rate, I, you know why? Because I was trying real hard. Then somebody told me that Jesus came to earth to do for me what I couldn't do for myself and that salvation was a gift. As I've said before, I was livid. I was angry. I felt like somebody who got ripped off. I'd been spending 18 years paying a mortgage into a home only to find out that all along the home was free. Jeez, thanks. Great. <laughs> I've, been, I've been busting my hump for 18 years trying to make myself good enough. And now you tell me it's a gift? And I came to the point of understanding it is. And that's what I did. For me, it was a decision. And I, was, I said, God, 
I don't remember exactly what I said. But for me, this is what it was like. I, I guess I understand that I can't make myself good enough. And I put my trust in what Jesus did for me. And I want his death on the cross to cover my sins. I remember when I did it. It was April of 1972. I lived in the quadrangle at the University of Pennsylvania. I was sitting on a cement bench, and a guy, Harvey Plug, who had been telling me about Jesus for a while, and I'd ask him about the native in Africa and all these questions, he finally asked me this, Mike, what's keeping you from accepting Jesus as your Savior? Because you know the truth. And I couldn't think of a, a reason why. And I prayed. And I'd like to say at that point, spiritually, I ended up doing more goofball things after that. Now, don't tell anybody this or I'll deny it. <laughs> I, I did. You know, at college, second year in college, that's when behavior tends to drop off the edge. And some of you, if, if you're not shaking your head up and down, you should be. <laughs> um, but it was at that point, though, something changed. My orientation towards God. So some of us can point to a decision, sometimes can't. But I think all of us would, would agree, it's a process, isn't it? There might have been an act, but the act leads to a process. Um, that's what Jesus, that's what Jesus indicates. I'm going to, no, I'm not going to go ahead to that. I looked at that, looked at that. Okay, this is my way of review. I'm not sure if I include this next one. No, that's not it. Okay. Um, Jesus said to the Jews who believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples. Then you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. Here's what I wanted to say. Jesus said, listen to me. If you hold to my teaching, there's an if. If you hold to my teaching, it doesn't say if you do it well or say it right. It doesn't say if you never sin. It says if you hold to my teaching, if you listen to what I say, make room for it. If you hold to my teaching, then you're my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Does that indicate that salvation is a one-time event where you get it all right away? No, absolutely not. It, there's a decision aspect of things. But experiencing salvation is having Jesus' word remain inside, making room for it, thinking, and he changes the way you think about God. And that's what salvation is about. It's a process. You learn things, and you get to know the truth, and the truth will get set you free. I'll tell you what, I've been a Christian now for... <laughs> yeah, you know, because I said that because I didn't want, I wanted to spare you the shock of telling you how long I've been a Christian because then you'd have to say, oh my goodness, Mike, I didn't realize you were that old. You know, you just told me you became a Christian at the University of Pennsylvania. So I'm thinking, you know, 18, 19 anyways. And, and you say you've been a Christian for 36 years. Oh, impossible. Now you're supposed to, okay. I've been, so that would make me, 19 and 36. Okay. That would make me. <laughs> now you're supposed to respond with appropriate shock. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Wise guys. Who said old? Okay. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Um, Talk about, um, that's what salvation means, and that was by way of review, but you'll see, and now we'll be able to cruise along. What we would have us do is, is salvation experience means living as sons, saying yes to son and daughter thoughts. God sends the Spirit into us to teach us to relate to Him as sons and daughters. Look at Galatians 4, 4 through 6 again. When the time had fully come, God sent His Son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. Son here is not just male. It's the designation for male and female in this context. 
since God sends the Spirit into us to teach us to relate to Him as sons and daughters, then, well, let me throw this at you. If you bring, your, if you bring something to someone who's an expert, the reason why you go to a physician or a mechanic is that they understand what's at the root of the problem. And you can understand what the root of the problem is by what they fix. Does that make sense? You know, you might say, my arm hurts. And a physician can understand there's some arm pain that's not about the arm at all. It's about the heart. And when they attend to the heart, then you say, oh, gosh, I never knew that. Now, here's God solves the human problem. The way he solves the problem indicates to us what the problem is. God sent his son into us to say, Abba, Father, would you agree with me? That would indicate at the deepest part of our pain, our problems, is... A desire to be regarded by one who is powerful and who will never leave us and forsake us. We've been home. You know, we've interacted with family. Interacting with family is bittersweet, isn't it? Some things change. People weren't there this year that had been there in other Christmases. Some of you experienced loss this past year. Boy, things are just different. The house isn't the same. Your parents aren't the same. And if, isn't it true that there's a sense of, oh, inside? And, and I think that that's deep. And you know what God says? What I want to do for you, I want to send my spirit into your heart to teach you to relate to me as a father. That's what God the Father says. And you know why he does that? Now, some of you are going to blow this off. At the deepest part of what you need, you need to relate to God as a father. You say, how do you know that, Mike? Because God fixes the problem, and that's how he fixed the problem. You're saying, are you, are you telling me, Mike, that some of the nuttiness that I deal with is really be solved if I understood that God was my father, and if I saw him as such? That's exactly what I'm saying. You're saying, I don't buy it. Fine, don't buy it. I understand that. There's a time I didn't buy it either. It's the truth. It's the truth. That's what God sends the Spirit to do, to teach you how to relate to Him as a father. This is what it means to be influenced by the Spirit. To be influenced by the Spirit is not to have a liver shiver. It's not to have a subjective expression. A subject, oh, I felt like I should call. Now, sometimes people get that, and I think it could be God. However, the influence of the Spirit is not a liver shiver or a subjective impression. The influence of the Spirit is... Call him Abba, because he's your father. That's what the Spirit tries to do inside you. Being influenced by the Spirit, then, is a matter of understanding how God regards you and how he is committed to you. Uh, the Spirit teaches us to think like sons and daughters of God. He teaches us to call God Abba. Look at what it says in Galatians 3. Understand, then, that those who believe are children of Abraham... When Paul wrote this letter to the Galatians, they were doing, they had done well at one point. He told them, you could be children of God through faith in Christ. And they said, great, and they felt free. We understand some of that feeling. Uh, when you first decided to follow Christ and you learned about that, God loves me? Gosh, that feels wonderful. That's how they felt. And somebody came in afterwards and said, yeah, <coughs> excuse me, God loves you. But he'll love you even more if you do the things the Jews have been doing for hundreds of years. And they said, oh, okay. You know what happened? They went from thinking like sons to thinking like slaves again. You mean I have to do ten things in order for God to love me? That's right. And they ended up believing that. They stopped thinking like sons and daughters, and they started thinking like slaves. And Paul writes the letter of Galatians to tell them to say yes to son and daughter thoughts. Why? Because God sends the Spirit inside to tell you you are part of God's forever family. To say yes to son and daughter thoughts and to say no to slave thoughts. Look what it says, Galatians 4, 28, 5, 1. 
Now you brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. At that time, the son born in the ordinary way persecuted the son born by the power of the Spirit. It's the same now. But what does the Scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son. The slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. Therefore, brothers, we are not children of the slave woman but of the free woman. What he's saying, we're not slaves anymore. We are children of the family. And then he goes on to say, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Don't allow yourselves to be burdened by a yoke of slavery. You know what you're going to have to do? And for some of us, this is hard. We were really good at saying yes to the truth. Some of us are really lousy at saying no to what isn't the truth. There's a lot of things being expressed as to why Jesus came and stuff like that. And if you listen to it on Christian radio, what I'd like to encourage you to do is to develop a clear no. That's not the truth. See, to stay remaining in Jesus, you can't just say yes to what's true. You have to say no to what isn't true. And when somebody comes and tries to get you to buy this thing, that if you send $100 or $1,000 that God will love you more, or the reason why you're experiencing this, you know, all that stuff, we have to develop an ability to discern. And some people claim to speak for God, but they don't know about being a child of a forever father. And we have to develop a capacity to say, no, I'm not going to name names. I couldn't. What I'm saying, though, I bet you for many of us, that is where you get tripped up. You might listen to something that feels good. Then you'll tune into something else, and it will say something that will make you feel, uh, and you know what you didn't do? No. That's not the truth. He's making me believe that I could be loved more if, no, no. You can't be loved anymore. You say, what if I believe that, Mike? What if you believe that? What would happen? The Spirit's voice would be clearer. You know what you would do? You would love Him. And that's what He wants. He wants you to love him. And and a lot of people make us afraid. They say, You better you... No. I don't need to be afraid of my father. Develop a no. Doesn't mean you have to yell at people. Mike said to do it. No. So you know, you can be tactful. No inside though. Say it. No. That doesn't sound right. Would you do me a favor? If you get hit by some teaching, there's a number of us here, I would love to talk with you about it. That's why we exist, to help one another to know what's true. And if you have questions, ask. Ask. There's a number of people here who would love to talk to you about it. That's why we're here. Um... Say yes to son and daughter thoughts and no to slave thoughts. Um, When you live as sons, then you can love as servants. Look what it says. You, my brothers, were called to be free. Do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, They loved each other in the beginning. When they were led to believe that God would love them more, you know what they started to do? what all of us do when we feel insecure. They started to compare themselves with one another. You ever see the way bodybuilders do it? When they're, they're in a workout room and they're, and they're just, you know, they're doing stuff. Well, they don't look like that. But, you know, they're just checking themselves out and everybody's flexing against and they're looking at one another and they feel better about their abs or, you know, all that fitness stuff that we're hearing so much about now since we've just gorged ourselves through the holiday. Um, that's what it's like spiritually, what happened. They were relating to God as a father. And everyone was together. And there was love. 
And then they came in, these missionaries came in, and contradicted what Paul said, God will love you even more. You know what they started to do? They started to check themselves out against one another, and they began to compare themselves. Were they focusing on the Father's commitments anymore? No. They were focusing on their behavior, and they started to turn on one another. You're not so hot. I've got to beat before you. Now, I might not know the Bible, but I know it a lot better than... Yvonne, would you poke Doug? You? <laughs> I'm just... Pecking orders. And, and that's how uh, love started to swirl down the drain. Uh, their ability to love rested upon the sense that they were children of God. That's why Paul tells them, understand that it's those who believe are children of Abraham. He told them three things. If God were to tell you three things, yeah. God would sit down with you and give you the top three things you need to know in order to be the person He wants you to be. What would those three things be? God would sit down face to face. You know what the three commands in Galatians are? List them here. Understand that those who believe are children of God. Understand those who believe are children of God. And secondly, don't allow yourselves to be burdened with the yoke of slavery. Say yes to son and daughter thoughts, number one. Say no to slave thoughts, number two. And in the freedom that you get from doing that, use it to serve others in love. Three things. That's what he would say. Say yes to son and daughter thoughts. Say no to slave thoughts. And with the freedom that you experience, serve one another in love. It says, even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus demonstrates for us the reason that you start to think like a son and daughter is not so that you can sit back in an easy chair. Jesus is our example. And what he would have us do is understand our freedom so well, understand that we will be included in eternal existence so clearly that we are willing to pour out our life in this life in order to get to the next. That's the way it's supposed to work. We're supposed to serve now. That's what Jesus tells us. Look what it says in the last verse. If you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit are sons of God. You do not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear. You receive the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry. There it is, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Worship team is going to come up. I'm going to tell you two things in closing. Worship team, come on up. It says that we need to put the deeds of the body to death. It says if by the Spirit you put the death, the deeds of the body, you will live. They're going to, says, I, want you to, I want you to carry this when you leave here. How does the Spirit put the deeds of the body to death? It says you have not, well, let me tell you. God does not frighten us into serving him and others. God fathers us into serving him and others. The way to put the deeds of the body to death is by yielding to the influence of the Spirit. Here's what the Spirit would influence you to believe, that you are a son or daughter of God. The misdeeds of the body will become less powerful the more you believe that you are a child of God. I'm going to say that again. If you're frightened of your father, the misdeeds of the body will become more powerful. That's the truth. Maybe not right away, but long term. To the degree we believe that through faith in Christ, we're part of God's forever family, the deeds of the body are destroyed because they are frightened to life and fathered to death. Uh, going to sing a worship song. Just in time for Christmas, slavery ended, sonship begun, salvation accomplished, salvation experienced. And we experience salvation as we say yes 
to son and daughter thoughts and no to slave thoughts and as we serve others in love. Uh, we're going to pray. Uh, we did this devotional this fall, 40 Days with the Ten Commitments. If some of you have that, that would be a great thing to do for the new year. Start it off on the first. Those are the kind of things that I think the Father would say to us. And as you focus on them and they become deeper, I think those are the kind of influences that would the Spirit would drill into. And if some of you say, what book, what? Uh, it's, it's over there. It's just a brown book. And there's a suggested donation to cover printing. If you don't have it, just take one. It just gives us the opportunity to look some things together that would help us to be more authentic sons and daughters of God. Now let me pray. Uh, Father, would you help us to understand who you are and what you're like? I guess what, from what we see here, it's critical. Understanding your character, what you're like, trusting you, is at the heart of it. You sent your spirit to communicate with our spirit that we are your children. I guess that means that's important. It's not optional. It's not kind of a nice idea, and if you really get low, then think about you as father. It's more than that. It's, it's heart healing. It's what you send to fix the problem. And I'd ask that you would give us a greater capacity to commit ourselves to looking at you as Father, living in the commitments that you make to us, and, and trusting you, I guess, so that we can be the sons and daughters you would have us to be. Uh, thanks for your Spirit, for your Son, and thanks for wanting to have a bigger family, an eternal one in Jesus' name. Amen.